John Gelati here with Inside Lacrosse TV welcoming Kyle Harrison in with uh, Nike STX Playmaker Lacrosse and also a partner in the LXM Tour. Yep. Thanks for coming in, man. Thanks for having me. In town in Baltimore, always good to have you. And uh, you and I always talk big picture about the game mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to kind of bring you in and, and just kind of fire away with a few questions. So yeah. uh, why don't we start off with what does lacrosse need to take the next step? Right. Well, I think we're getting close, right? I think if you look at the, the TV coverage this year, I living out in L.A., I could turn on you know, ESPNU or ESPN2 on a, on a Saturday afternoon, I could catch like three games, you know, three different games plans. So I think uh, we're headed the right direction. I'd like to see some type of shot clock, clock implemented somewhere because I think, you look at the athletes that are playing these days, you look at how good the defender stick skills are, goalie store and outlet passes. We should be getting up and down the field more, um, which would clearly make outsiders to our sport when they turn on ESPN2 and see that they'd be even more excited about the game. <clears throat> so we're headed the right direction as far as TV coverage. I just want to make the games faster because that's going to appeal to more people that don't necessarily know much about our sport. Yeah, that seemed to be the, one of the biggest complaints this year and coming off some of the NCAA tournament games with some stalling warnings and, and a lot of slowdown game. Uh, do you think that is turning off a lot of people? If, you, if, if you're a random sports fan, you turn on a lacrosse game and you see a 6-5 game with guys standing around doing nothing, right. is that a big deterrent? Is that a big kind of a, a, a barrier to the sports growth right now? I mean, I think so. I mean, it all depends on how you look at it. I think for us, guys that understand the sport, we get why that's happening. It's, it's coaches strategizing and then have game plans for different players on the field. So we get why there's a, a stall warning or why someone's holding onto the ball or why some of the team's playing zone. Like, we understand those things. But for the random person that just likes sports and wakes up Saturday morning at 1 p.m. and turns on the game and they see one team holding the ball behind the goal and the rest of the defenders just sit in front of the goal in a zone, like, I don't think they're going to turn that same game on next Saturday. So I think implementing a shot clock is just going to speed things up a little bit. And I don't, I don't think it should be, you know, 30 seconds or 45. Let's give people a full minute or even a minute and a half. But let's make sure we can't have those two and a half minute lapses where nothing happens. Now, you're also involved with the LXM Pro Tour, um, which just had a pretty very successful event in Southern California. Another, another event coming up in July in, uh, in Towson, Maryland, as part of the uh, Under Armour All-American game. I right. uh, also have Wale coming with that, which is pretty cool. Now, you and I have spoken about LXM a million times. Mm -hmm. um, where are you guys uh, in terms of your development and, and how happy are you with, with what you've accomplished and, and where you're kind of pointed? Right. Well, I think <clears throat> first and foremost, we all love the sport and the sport's done everything for us. We, it's gotten us into college. It's gotten us jobs after college. Um, you know, most of my closest friends are people in the lacrosse community. So the sport's done everything for us, and we want to make sure we're doing our part to grow the game and continue to provide players with the opportunity to play the sport at a high level. So uh, from, from that perspective, it's been great. You know, like you just mentioned, the, the event um, in Orange County two weeks ago was great. Yeah, you know, um, the players were there. It's great having, you know, Chris Vitelli on tour, one of my favorite players of all time, Graham Gill. Uh, I love watching that guy run around. I used to compete against him in Navy Hopkins games all the time. So the, the level of play was great. Um, the kids there, the clinic beforehand was great. Uh, and the concert was a lot of fun. So, you know, to be honest, it's, it's going the right direction. We're really excited to come back to Baltimore. You know, the majority of our events, Austin, Texas. Um, you know, we had something smaller in Las Vegas. We've been in Orange County twice now. So it's nice to be able to come back to the East Coast. You know, we had one in Philly last August. Um, so it's going to be cool to be in Baltimore and be able to show the, the East Coast across community what the event's about. Because, you know, at the end of the day, everyone wants to run their mouth about what we're trying to do or what it's not doing. And I think if you actually come to the event, you just see it's a bunch of guys that love the sport, want to keep playing at a high level, and want to grow the sport. And that's exactly what we're doing. It seems like it happens with a lot of new things in the sport, new, whether it's new people involved or, or you know, current people trying something new. You just automatically want it, want something to fail almost, right. and it seems like that LXM is attracting those kinds of detractors. I mean, why why do you think that is, and, and how do you guys deal with that? You can't worry about it, right? That's gonna anything you do that's that's somewhat new or different. The traditionalists aren't gonna like it, and they're they're gonna talk about it. But I think at the end of the day, like I said, I, I hope people will will eventually understand that we love this sport and we want it to grow and we want to keep playing at a high level. Um, and that's, that's what all the professional avenues are trying to do for the sport, whether that's the NLL, MLL, whatever it is. That, that's what people are trying to provide, more opportunities for players to play and for the sport to grow. And, and we're no different. That's exactly what our, what our goal is. So you can't worry about what people say as far as haters or, or detractors or people saying negative things. You just got to kind of keep going, keep plugging along. And if you believe in something, keep at it. 
Well, you, you talk to a lot of people, um, you know, through either through Nike or through the LXM stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, people maybe that are not as familiar with the sport, not involved with the sport directly. Right. Well, what's kind of the common thread with those people when when you're talking to them about this game that might be a little bit unfamiliar or new to them? Right. I mean, honestly, man, it's close. You know, it's you'll see guys that have sponsorships. You know, like Paul with Red Bull. That's that's huge. The fact that someone's sponsored by a, a non lacrosse company. That's a big deal. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have relationships with Beats. Beats headphones, which is crazy. You know, I, was, I sat in their office a couple weeks ago and just talking about the sport and talking about the direction it's headed and, and seeing their excitement about it. Not, they don't really know too much about it yet, but seeing their excitement about it um, is a wonderful thing. So that just means our sport's headed the right direction and that people really see the upside to it and, and we all just got to stay with it, stay together, and keep pushing it. So then I guess, you know, conversely, what, what do you think is the biggest kind of problem or, or, you know, thing that, that needs to be corrected in the game right now? It depends, man. I think it depends on the level we're talking about. There are clearly always things that could be worked on and improved upon. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of camps through Playmaker and, and for Nike and STX, and I see kids all over the world playing at a really young age and then dropping every other sport. So stopping playing football, stopping basketball, stopping volleyball, stopping soccer, stopping all the other things they play and just focusing on lacrosse from such a young age. So by the time they get to junior year in high school and then eventually on to college, they've just had enough. You know, they've been coached up so much that they get into a system and the college coach has to break that all down and then reteach them the schemes that, you know, they want to teach. So I think, uh, you know, at the youth level, I'd like to see kids play more than one sport. You look at the best players in the world, all those guys, they play multiple sports. You know, growing up, I played basketball, lacrosse, and soccer my entire life until I couldn't anymore and I had to start, you know, focusing on lacrosse solely. And uh, you look at all the best players around, that's, that's what those guys have done. So. At the youth level, I'd say that, and then as you get as you get um, to the college level, we, we spoke about it briefly. I'd say let's implement a shot clock, and it doesn't need to be a short one. You know, it doesn't need to put these guys on a 30, 45 second leash. Like give them a minute, minute and a half to get the ball around, clear it, get in an offense, and, and then get into something. Um, just because that'll speed the game up. And as college continues to get more media coverage and more TV coverage, I love to see those people that randomly end up tuning in on a Saturday morning see that and see just ball going up and down the field and they're like, oh my gosh, I love this thing. And, and that clearly we just grow even more. You mentioned that the multi-sport thing and I think any Division One coach you know, always tells me and will tell kids, play more more than one sport. It, it's great for your development athletically. Right. Um, what other advice would you have for, for a young lacrosse player in terms of getting better as a lacrosse player? I mean, like, other than playing other sports, is there a certain right. thing, drill, uh, you know, a certain thing that helped you along the way or that maybe that you still do that, that's right. really key for, for a young kid today? Right, well, I think the thing that I kind of learned, and I didn't learn until late, I kind of learned it my late in high school and then definitely in college, is when you go out to practice on your own, one, you have to go at full speed. It's really tough to do when you're out in the field by yourself, no one else is there, and like you're just flying around, that's tough to do. So I'd say that's number one. When you go out to practice on your own, pick one thing that you want to work on, whether that's shooting on the run, depending on what your position is. And for me, it was shooting on the run as a midfielder. So I'd go out there, I'd throw 50 balls at the top of the straight line, split from right to left, sprint, and take a shot that I'm actually going to take in a game. And I think when I see kids at camp, or we have a clinic and they're shooting around beforehand, you never see kids taking like real shots, right? You see them like 15 yards away, shooting from low to high off their back foot, and they'll throw 20 over the goal, hit one in the corner, and be happy about it. But I would say, let, like find one skill that you really want to become great at, and go out every day for half an hour, 45 minutes, and go full speed and practice that skill, because you're going to see yourself get better and better and better. And, and I, think, uh, I think that's definitely something that every lacrosse playing kid doesn't necessarily do right now. Everybody likes to work out. I, I think we have a strange sport in that, I don't know if you see it in every sport, our guys like love shooting. We love playing, we love working. You, you'll see, you can drive around Baltimore fields, and their goals out there, you'll see kids out there playing. We love our sport. So I think I, I just want to see us take it to the next level. So now when you're out there on that field, like, let's go hard. Go for 45 minutes and go as hard as you possibly can and really get better at something. Uh, so when you come out the next day, let's pick a new skill and get better at that. So that, that's what I'd like to see from kids. Now, as a post-collegiate player, uh, it's obviously important to work on your own. You're, kind of, you're basically yeah. on your own, whether you're in what, a pro league or, yep. or club league or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're on your own. And, and I think this still applies to, to you know high school kids, college kids in the summertime when you're kind of on your own as well. Mm -hmm. well what is the key to... to, to working and getting better on your own when you're not in practice every day, you're not working out as part of the team every day, when, right. when you're pretty much on your own trying to motivate yourself. You have to be, you just said it, you have to be self-motivated. You know, I think when you're in college, you have a goal, you want to win a national championship, I, I think. So when you go out in the field, you're working every day because you want to support, you want to be a part of the team, you want to support your team, you want to do your part to help the team win a national championship. And then I think once you, once you graduate from that, and whether you play NLL, MLL, LXM, whatever it is, 
now you have more self-motivated people have jobs people have families there's a lot a lot of other variables that can throw you off so for me personally I feel like there's still things I need to get a lot better at, you know, and I, and I think there's still things I can get better at, so that's what motivates me, and I, I think if you asked a bunch of other pro players, they'd say the same thing. Was there a different motivation for you in, in high school and college? Was something that specific that was driving you to get better, and, and you know, especially, you know, I think you know, your evolution freshman year to, to mm -hmm. senior year was pretty dramatic. What, what, was, what was the key to that, to that development? The key to that development, I think, my freshman year, I enjoyed playing, but I had no idea what I was doing. I was really, literally an athletic kid running around trying not to mess up so coach didn't yell at me. Um, and then, you know, I, that summer, I kind of figured out that, you know, I worked with Coach Petra and Coach Tierney a lot, and I learned that, like, all right, you know, I, I could be good at this thing if I really dial in and work on developing each skill. Like my stick skills weren't great. My shooting on the run wasn't great. I, my con concepts, understanding how defense, where to slide, what to do, all that wasn't great. And it was just because I hadn't put the time in to really learn each specific skill. So when I put in a whole summer of just doing that, and then I came back in the fall, my sophomore year, and like really like got it, like I felt it, it just made, motivated me even more to say, oh my, like, what have I been doing for you know the past three years? Why didn't I do this in high school? So for the rest of college, I literally just focused on every single day, learning something new about the sport, picking up something new, watching other players play. You know, I, I learned so much from watching you know, Kevin Bolin, A.J. Hogan, Jay Jalbert, just watching these great midfielders play and just slowly picking things from each of them and going out the next day and really working on it on my own. So uh, I think that summer of between my freshman and sophomore year is really when I finally understood what it meant to work hard. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned a couple guys. Uh, you know, if you had to pick a, a dream team right now of, of uh, you know, your favorite players, putting together your ideal team across all eras, you know, it could be Jim Brown, it could be, you know, uh, a freshman in college right now. Right. Who, who would kind of be some of those guys that, that, would, that would be on that team? Yeah, I definitely, I couldn't put together like a team off the top of my head. I mean, there, there are tons of, I'm, I'm a lacrosse fan, so there are tons of guys that I enjoy their game. I like watching them play. Um, if I had to pick a face-off guy that I just think is the best, it'd, it'd have to be Paul Canabin. You know, I, I haven't seen anything like that, and what, what he was able to do consistently. So he'd, he'd be the guy there. Uh, clearly, I'd love to play with, with a Jim Brown. I, different eras, like you said, but I would love to see see him on a field and see what he's able to do. Um, some of my other favorite guys, I mean, midfielders, I, A.J. Hogan was, was the guy that I would watch and be like, I, I don't even get how he's doing these things. It looks like he's not trying, but dude is just lighting people up. So he was a guy that I, that I looked up to and I still look up to, uh, you know, Jalbert, um, Adam Doniger in college was a guy I, I really looked up to and a guy that I got to play with a little bit professionally. Uh, clearly it'd be great to play with Paul again. Got to play for a year together in college and uh, I mean he's able to do some things now that I don't think we've, we've really seen anyone do before. Um, and then at attack, I, the list is going forever. You know, I, I, Mikey Powell is, is pretty, uh, pretty absurd. I, I think the fact that People still just talk about him and watch his, his highlights and, you know, even, it's not even kids, it's professional, it's, you know, it's like grown people talking about it. I mean, the stuff, stuff he's able to do is pretty incredible, so I'd love to, love to get on the field with him again. And again, there are tons, I mean, Junior, uh, Walters, you know, Chaz, there, there, there are tons of players. But uh, it was really cool for me in the LXM event two weeks ago to get on the field with Ramel and Shamel just because, uh, you know, I've been fans of those guys since they were younger. Um, I was at Hopkins when they were, you know, starting to go through that recruiting process um, a little bit. And uh, they're, they're just really athletic and they're great players and I'm excited to see, uh, you know, which direction they go as far as their player development because I, I know they're still working hard and then they're self-motivated kids and just like we talked about, um, they, they want to improve their game. So it was fun to be on the field with them and run around. And, uh, and I guess the last two, the last guy I'd say is, I know I said his name earlier, but Graham Gill. I, I still think, dude, didn't get enough didn't get uh, didn't get all he deserved. The, the kid just plays so hard, and he plays on both sides of the ball, um, and he's a great player. So I would love to play with him again. Now you mentioned Ramel and Shamel. Obviously, a tough ending to their college careers. Mm -hmm. Where are they now, and and what I guess what do they do next? Right. Uh, you said it. It's tough tough end to the career without it, without a doubt. Um, I can't speak to what happened because I don't know specifically. Uh, I just know what I heard from you all and then what I, what I read. So, I mean, at the end of the day, in my opinion, I think they're, they're going to do the right thing. They, uh, they may have made some bad decisions, but they're going to they're gonna build themselves back up. They love lacrosse. They love the support they get. 
um, and they're going to continue to you know teach kids the sport and get, try and get back out in front of people and kind of kind of make it right. Um, and and we'll see where it goes. But again, they're they're ready to work and they're ready to uh, ready to do the right thing. I think. Good. It's good to hear. Um, now you mentioned a lot of offensive guys and, and the faceoff guy in there, yeah. but no defenseman. Oh yeah, we didn't we didn't make it there. Yeah, I mean poles that. I mean, the list could go on forever too. Uh, Kyle Sweeney, you know, Brett Hughes, another great one. Um, Brody Merrill, clearly great one. Uh, I got to watch um, Flanagan a lot. Ryan Flanagan, I'd like to get on the field with him. I'm looking forward to that um, because he, he's a big dude. And I know uh, last year he had a huge year, and then this year he was hurt fighting through it all year um, and still played <laughs> play pretty well. So I'm excited to, uh, to get on the field with him one day, hopefully. And uh, how many was that? That was three, right? Three or four? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, I'll go with that. And as far as goalies, I mean, I've played with some great ones. I've been really fortunate. Kua, I mean, clearly Jesse Schwartzman has had an amazing career. I got to play with him for a couple years at Hopkins, won a championship with him. Uh, great goalie and, and turned into a really good leader, which is, which is cool to see. Um, guys that have jammed me, Doc, clearly, <laughs> is, is always an issue to play against him, so I would love to actually be on his team. Um, and then, you know, the guy that I think is, is one of the best ever and after college he just kind of you know started to do his own thing moved to San Francisco and started working but Tillman Johnson was just uh, he was incredible so I'd love to, love to be on a team with him. Um, now I know another thing that, that you've, uh, you've been kind of on top of um, I think what 10% of NCAA players are, are African American which, yeah. which seems uh, like a shockingly no, low number that mm -hmm. I saw recently. Mm -hmm. What, what needs to change there, and, and what, what I mean, what, what's kind of happening? I think on your end to, to right. try to help that out as kind of a, an, obviously an idol and a, yeah. a you know a key leader there. I mean, honestly, man, it's slowly growing. It's great. You know, the more the more African Americans we can see play the sport, and, and kids, and we can get in communities, so kids can say, oh, he looks like me, and he plays. Like I want to play because uh, growing up for me, I, I think. You know, my dad played, so clearly that's that's why I learned about the sport. But for a lot of other kids, if you look at a poster and there's you know a, a guy that looks like you playing basketball, then you look at a poster and there's a guy that doesn't look like you playing another sport, and you're a little guy, so you haven't really necessarily understood what's going on in the world. You're probably going to pick the one with the guy that looks like you. You know, so I think uh, just making sure that we get in front of these kids and, and kind of teach them that look, there are black guys play in this sport, you know, you should get involved with it. It's a great opportunity. You can use it as a tool to get into school. Um, and then after college, you can use it to get a job. There's just so many opportunities that this sport can provide you with. Um, and we just have to do our part. So, you know, I, it, it was great. I, I actually ran into Damian Davis, Damian Davis last weekend um, down in inner city Baltimore. He was coaching like three or four teams with a bunch of kids, which was great. I know Chaz Woodson does a lot. John Christmas does a lot. The Brattons are doing a lot. Um, you know, I'm trying to do as much as I possibly can. So it's just getting in the communities, showing the kids that look, there are guys that look like you play in the sport and it's a great opportunity and then teaching them the way to do it. And, uh, and, and I, I think we're growing, we are. You know, I think every year we're seeing more and more and more. So I'm excited about it. Are we going to get to that point soon where it's not really a story that, you know, Shamel is the best African-American player since whoever and, yeah. and your name doesn't come up at every you know, every guy who comes up? Like, yeah. is it just going to be natural at some point or what's... I hope, right? I don't I don't think we're... We're not there yet, but it's at some point. Um, I, I hope we get there, but at, at the same time, we're, we're, all, we're all proud that we're involved in the sport and proud that we've been able to, to have some success in the sport. So we're a very tight knit group of dudes and it's it's a nice situation because you know I, I didn't know Chaz in college because Hopkins didn't play Brown but we respected each other and we had a relationship because of the common bond that we shared um, and so right when we graduated and we were able to actually be around each other you know Chaz is one of my close friends now John and I talk you know talk often the Brattons clearly you know we have a relationship there so I hope one day uh, it's not a story but at the same time I'm okay with it being a story Nice. Well, uh, anything else you want to add while uh, while we got you sitting in the in the hot seat? I think we hit it all. Are you get anything off the top of your head? Um, national championship prediction, 2012, NCAA. Next, Hopkins. Of course. Final four. Since you can only pick. Yeah, since I can only pick one to one team for that. Uh, let's see. Honestly, I don't do. I, hmm. If I had to pick four for the final four, let's go with Hop. I think. I think Denver will be back. Uh, Cuse lost all those seniors, right? Yeah, but they always find a way to somehow get back in there. So let's go Hop, Denver, Cuse, 
and it pains me, but UVA. Wow, all right. Well, I appreciate you stopping by, man. Of course, absolutely. Thanks Good for luck. Me. Thanks so much. Of course.